study in time. Perhaps just in time. This is where we start. This is today. Go back with us 10 years, or 100 years, or 1,000, or 10,000, or 100,000. Go back with us 5 billion years, because this is where we must start. Here, before the beginning. Already, empty space is filled, filled with stars. Cold, silent space. Space curving in upon itself to fit the equations of future man. Or, expanding space to fit the equations of other future men. Future men because man has yet to arrive. Cut the line of time in half. See, two and a half billion years ago. In half. See, two and a half billion. From this shall come Earth. Divide the remainder of the time until today in half. A fire, heat and flame, then water and air. But still no life that future man will discover even as a fossil. Divide time again in half. And from the water to the shore, from the sea to the beach, someplace, somehow, man is slowly swimming, creeping to the land walking, facing his first challenge, survival. Divide time now to only 50,000 years ago. Man is man at last. Communication has started. But no structure yet built by man will survive for us to see it today. Instead of billions or millions of years ago, look now at only 4,000 years ago. The Great Pyramids have been built, man's first lasting structure. Over two billion years since the start of the Earth. Cut time in half to 2,000 years ago. The Parthenon of Greece is completed. The Great Wall of China has begun. 1,000 years ago, Nero has watched Rome burn. Vikings are on the seas. Great religions have started. 500 years ago, Movable type has been invented, and man's communication is extended. Time in half again. Both the Pacific Ocean and the law of gravity have been discovered. 75 years ago, man has invented both propeller and captive balloon. Half of 75 years ago is about 38. Vaudeville has started, and newspapers are well established. Radio spreads the word. The self-starter creates new roads. 19 years left. Einstein wins the Nobel Prize. Motion pictures add sound. Now time moves so quickly, events become blurred. By 10 years ago, Russia has won too. Television has started. Five years ago, the first atomic submarine. The countdown on history ends with new events in new places until suddenly, it is today, and we are already out of date. This is the line of time as we first saw it. But this is the rate at which things in this time are happening. From space, which created Earth, to Earth sending its creation back into space. Time has accelerated. This is the growth of America's population. The amount of life insurance in force and our electrical energy output have both followed this curve of growth. And so has the annual sales of Procter & Gamble. Time itself is moving in this line. Old-fashioned ways of doing things just can't keep up. New inventions replace old ones. Old products face new competition. Where there were few, there are now many. Just to hold its own, business must grow at this rate. Just as total business has grown. But study this curve of growth. What today is to prevent it from changing? From slowly leveling, from a growth curve as it was to this. The exponential, the curve of the plateau, and perhaps the decline. We believe the difference between this the growth curve, and this, the exponential curve, is this.
great companies were built by men. Men whose vision showed them how to manufacture production. But increases in production without correspondingly great increases in consumption soon becomes overproduction. And no one needs to be told what overproduction under consumption quickly leads to. Most of us remember too well. The 1959 steel strike shows what happens when an industry which can produce does not produce. Our economy lost an estimated six billion dollars. Steel workers alone lost one billion one hundred sixty million dollars in wages. And from just this half million people in only 116 days, the government lost over one hundred million dollars in taxes, plus uncounted millions more from people in industries allied with steel. That's what happens due to underproduction. Look what happens due to underconsumption. In 1955, just the three big automobile manufacturers sold a total of 6.8 million new cars. In 1958, public demand was lower, and these same three companies sold only 4 million new cars. This is a loss of almost 2.8 million new cars to the public. But just as important, this is a tax loss to government of $530 per unsold car. A total tax loss of $1,434,000,000. Thus had just one major industry been able to sustain the proven level of public demand for its product. Think what over a billion new dollars could have done for education for public health. Just as when the steel industry operates at less than its potential and the automobile industry operates at less than its potential, so too with other industries which could make more if they could sell more. There's a better way of life lost to the public, a profit loss to management, a wage loss for labor, and a tax loss for government. Looking at the post-war business recession years of 1949, 1954, and 1958, the Wall Street Journal reported in January that it was this process of buying and producing less than was being sold that caused the sharp declines in overall business activity and the accompanying losses of employment. To keep inventories stabilized, production was reduced instead of increasing consumption, which in turn would reduce inventories and create the need for still more production. Knowing this, Companies which were built by men who knew how to manufacture production are today being kept great by men who know how to manufacture consumption, the other end of the inventory balance, the production line itself. It has already been said, whatever it was in bygone days, today ours is of necessity a consumption rather than a production economy. Today the manufacturer of production can only follow the manufacturer of consumption. Increased demand for a product creates the need for more of that product. Instead of cutting production to match demand, increase demand to increase production. And this, the manufacture of the demand and the consumption, can only be done through the creation of new customers, new volume of consumption on the part of old customers, new uses for old products, new needs for new products, new improvements in all products. And this, all this, is the task of advertising. To keep production high, we need more advertising, more effective advertising, more efficient advertising, faster advertising. Advertising that runs fast and runs in the right direction. Advertising that keeps up with the production of the industry. Let us look at each side of advertising, each in turn. First, more advertising. For some industries, this means spending more money. In the automobile industry, for example, had one company sold 25% more automobiles, its profits would have been 60% greater. Increased consumption can mean disproportionately greater increases in profit. For other industries, more advertising can mean reaching more people. Reaching one million people from a population of 100 million may have been fine in the past. But the same one million reached out of tomorrow's population of 200 million is only half as good. Just to keep up, you need to double your reach. Reaching people comes in many degrees. First, in sheer coverage, placing your messages where people can be exposed. This is circulation or set counts. Second, once you have coverage, is actually reaching people, 
so that those who can receive your ideas actually do receive them. There are three main ways to turn coverage into reach. The first is to attract. To make more people want to see what you have to say. The second way is to intrigue. Through some device to entice people, intrigue people to receive your message. But both these, to attract and to intrigue, often require so much effort that there's too little room to adequately present the message, too little left to convince. Even with the most popular, the power to attract or intrigue is not enough to convert non-customers to customers because they don't reach non-customers. For almost everything sold, there are more non-customers than there are customers. For example, the majority of people do not drive the most popular make of automobile. The majority of people do not smoke the most popular brand of cigarettes, drink the most popular coffee, use the most popular toothpaste, detergent, lipstick, soap. Less than a third of the people ever saw the most popular motion picture. Less than a tenth have read the most popular non-religious book. Two-thirds of the people do not know who Van Cliburn is. Perhaps the majority of the people are still non-customers because we have failed to cover them. Or maybe if your coverage has gone where they are, you still have not reached them. In spite of your best efforts to attract them, or intrigue them, you still haven't reached them. Perhaps then, now is the time to intrude. And you can do it nicely too. And now is the time to convert people to customers. Our own production lines won't wait. It took 120 years from the first human flight in a captive balloon to the invention of the airplane. From the first airplane, it was 27 years before the first jet plane. From the jet to the breaking of the sound barrier took only 17 years. From the sound barrier, it was 10 years before the first satellite. From satellite to a rocket on the moon, only three years. And how long now before man on the moon? Time is moving ever faster, and if we wait, we may well find ourselves old-fashioned, out of date. We may find what others already take for granted difficult for us to understand. We may find ourselves left behind. For the production of consumption, let us look at one way. The electronic machine of today, the communication medium of today, television. Listen to the music of machines. Watch the men who make them work. Men with lunch pails and weathered faces and iron backs and arms of steel. It's the pulse of progress you hear. It's the music of proud men at work. Men of the Kaiser Industries, making the basic products that build. Making Kaiser steel, Kaiser aluminum, Kaiser gypsum, and Kaiser permanente cement. Producing Jeep vehicles building for Kaiser engineers, an army of men, a million machines. Put them all together, you'll hear the pulse of progress. You'll know the men of the Kaiser Industries, building together for a better world. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this commercial is going to use subliminal, subliminal, subliminal advertising that means you will never see or hear the name of the product. Oh, it'll be there on the screen, all right, but the naked eye cannot detect it. This way you sit back, relax, and enjoy me as I tell you this rather funny story. It seems that these three men decided to take a trip. The second guy goes back to the dry cleaner and says... He opens the little door, goes ip, 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 ip. So the third guy says, Yeah, but you better bring back the hangers. <laughs> uh -huh. 
1958 was a recession year in many industries, but it was not a recession year in advertising. For one reason. Look at what the nation's top 100 advertisers did to maintain their own sales, and incidentally, advertising sales at the same time. They spent 41 million less in newspapers, 10 million dollars less in other media. This would have led to a total advertising business decline of 52 million dollars just from these top 100 advertisers, except for one thing. These same advertisers spent almost 45 million more in spot television, 45 million dollars more in network television. This 90 million dollars growth in television not only overcame the 52 million dollars loss created by other media, but led 1958 to a year in which the top 100 spent 37 million dollars more than the year before. For its own business of advertising, therefore, television turned 1958 from a recession year to a record year and created over $37 million in new advertising dollars as well. Television has created new industries, new employment, new products as quickly as it created itself. Listen to an expert. Television has affected advertising in a basic way, taking new products and developing them and getting them across to the public faster than anything I have ever known. It makes a terrific contribution to speeding up the time period in which you can win success. Television creates business. The telephone companies receive $40 million a year in television's line costs. Television itself spent $400 million a year for on-the-air talent. Television, through just the use of its sets, provides the electric power industry over $511 million a year. Over 700 millions as more homes buy color sets. And last year, when there were already over 40 million television homes, people spent over $1 billion to buy new television sets. Since the start of the medium, advertisers have invested $7 billion in television. But the public, just in the purchase of new television sets, has spent over twice this amount, $16 billion. Just as television has created new markets for products, it has created new concepts in marketing. One of the most important of these is a new concept of what a market actually is. Starting with this empty outline map of the nation, history has added these political boundaries, these county and state lines. In the past, the advertiser followed these political boundaries to divide the nation into his own distribution areas. His marketing map was based on this political map. Here, for example, is the market map of one advertiser based on these state and county lines. He's divided the country into different markets for purposes of controlling his distribution and sales, and his dividing lines follow these state and county lines. But today, thanks to television, the advertiser is learning that there's little sense in fitting his marketing map to this political map, not when a better concept is available. Today, cities have grown new suburbs. The suburbs of one city intertwine with those of another. Long chains of interurbia have grown which ignore political lines. So, advertisers wishing to reach all these people, both city and suburban, have replaced this political map with a map based upon ease of reaching people. This concept starts with television, the easiest way of reaching people. The advertiser starts with the television antenna and draws the appropriate 50 to 100 mile TV coverage circle around this antenna. This, all this area, now becomes one market. This single television market may include several counties, several cities, even several states, but it's considered one market, reached from one source. This old marketing map, and let's remove the political lines to leave just this advertiser's market lines, this old marketing map divided the country as you can see. Let us construct the new marketing map. Here again is the empty outline map of the nation. To know where we are, let's again add the political lines. And now to this same map, let us add the television coverage areas. Now we have a map which shows the nation divided into groups of people able to be reached by a single source, by any single television station in each market. 
Now from our new marketing map, let's delete the old political lines, leaving only the television coverage areas. The result? Today's marketing map. Compare this pattern of today on the right with the old pattern on the left. This is a marketing revolution more and more advertisers are joining. It starts with the ease of reaching people. It goes next to the belief that first should be the advertising, then the distribution. Distribution plan to follow advertising. Today's market, starting with the television antenna and covering both city center and suburbs at the same time, today's market has many names. Teleurbia, Megatown, media coverage areas, it doesn't matter. This new division of the country, according to the ease of reaching people, is making advertising more efficient and making distribution fit the pattern of this more efficient advertising. We invite you to compare your markets with these television markets. As television creates markets, it creates distribution within these markets. You know how Less Toil created its own demand through the television advertising. Television which has indeed helped create the entire liquid detergent field. The aerosol dessert topping industry. The new and improved instant potato products. Instant coffee and endless other highly competitive product fields which must attract, intrigue, and intrude to capture new markets. No one is surprised to see that Food Topics, 164 top grocery store new product promotions last year included 129, which employed television sometimes as the basic medium, sometimes as the only medium. Television's ability to create business has led it to account for 49% of the total budget of the nation's top 100 advertisers. And television in 1959 was the number one national advertising medium for the fifth straight year. Why? There are 52 million homes in America. 98% of them can receive a television signal. This is TV's coverage. 86% of all the American homes own at least one television set. 78% of all American homes watch television every day. That's almost 41 million homes a day. That's television's reach. Look for a moment at television's individual programs, the Nielsen Top 10 for 12 months. Here is the number of homes delivered per telecast by the top of the Top 10 and the bottom of the top 10. That's a year-round average of over 18 million on top. 12 million, 10 shows lower down. The winter and summer average delivered audience of television. But let's forget the top-rated shows. Overlook the average shows and see what happened to the lowest-rated programs, those with the smallest audiences. First, take all the months of the year. Plot the time spent viewing per television home for all of 1958, an average of over five hours a day. Then pick one period that's about average, April. Take all three networks. Take every half hour period throughout the evening of every night of the week and take the program with the smallest audience of each half hour, the lowest rated program of each period. The result? The average audience reached by these lowest rated programs is over six million different homes reached per telecast. This is not television circulation or coverage. This is television's delivered audience and for its lowest rated programs in a single telecast. Compare these figures of over six million homes viewing your message with the potential audience of other media you'll find these least successful TV programs deliver more than the most successful of other media. But these are homes, turn now to people, and look again at a single day. In one day, television reaches 70% of all the men in the nation, regardless of whether they own a TV set. In the same day, it reaches 78% of all women. To the surprise of many, in a single day, television reaches 89% of all teenagers. Virtually every child over three is a television viewer every day. Add it up yourself 
it comes to over 128 million different people viewing television in a single day. This figure, incidentally, includes more adults voting for television every day than voted for everyone in the last presidential election. Reaching people is important, but just as important is the speed with which you reach these people. Time costs money. The longer the time, the higher the cost. A major portion of the cost of anything manufactured is the time required to make it. The longer a product sits on the dealer's shelf, the more it costs the dealer, the less he can charge for it. Just to get rid of it, he often sells it below cost. In the food field, the number one factor in evaluating new products by buying offices is rate of turnover, velocity of selling, a factor third in importance only 10 years ago. The speed of your production line is determined by the speed of your consumption line. For advertising was once considered only a lubricant to the manufacturing machine, it is today being recognized as the power which runs this machine. Today's advertising must reach millions of people instantly to tell them about new products, new designs, new uses, new prices. In business, as in political life, once your competitor has announced a change, you're too late to do anything but reply. He has the advantage of time. The difference between too late and on time is the speed with which you reach people. Your advertising speed may be the governor of the speed of your production. So, time is important. And the time you buy on television is the time you save. The function of advertising is to increase sales and from sales comes the profit. From profit comes the money for more advertising. Then the faster this cycle of advertising to sales to profit to dollars for more advertising, the faster the profits. And this linked chain of advertising to sales to profits to more advertising carries with it two more links. First, increased sales means the need for increased production. Increased production to keep up with the new demand for product. And second, Increased profit means increased taxes. Increased taxes based upon increased profit. The public benefits by more products. Industry benefits by more profits. Government benefits by more taxes. Labor benefits by more employment. And all because someone made something and presented it in a way that led others to want to buy it. The quicker this cycle of production, to purchase, to increase production, to increase purchase, the quicker the accumulation of taxes and profits. As Paul G. Hoffman, director of the United Nations Special Fund reports, the United States, along with many other high-income countries, is today faced with two tasks of great magnitude and urgency. One of these is to speed its own development, to promote that rate of economic growth at home which is necessary to sustain high employment, realize our industrial and scientific potentiality, and maintain our position in the world. Just as speed in development is important in our world position, so too is speed important in the advertising which can support this development. Advertising that reaches people now, and not weeks from now, is in the best position to create sales now, profits now. A small budget spread through the year does not mean the advertiser reaches more people. He just took longer to reach people. Had he spent it quickly, reached people quickly, created sales quickly, he might well have been able to re-enter the market with new advertising dollars before the year was completed. But the speed of reaching people does not mean just attracting their attention, whether you attract, intrigue, or intrude. It means the speed with which you implant your idea, register your message, convince. And this speed of conviction depends upon the tools for selling you have. The availability of the right tools to do the job makes the difference between an amateur and a professional. Between being able to communicate only a simple idea or a complex one. This selection of the right tools can mean the difference between self-sufficiency and insufficiency. Selection of the right tools means the difference between this and this. It can bring you closer to something, let you be calm and mysterious or clear and dramatic let you change your mood as you change your mind. And television itself is adding new creative tools for better advertising through color, through videotape. With the right tools creatively employed, 
you can reach the minds of people as quickly as you reach their eyes and ears. Your depth of penetration may make a single contact more effective than a long series of contacts in other media. In manufacturing, the better your tools, the better your product. In advertising, the better your tools, the better your product. Television's tools have not been measured. Few are even counted. But count them for yourself. Consider them when you compare media for your advertising, manufacturing dollar. Take the tools of television, each in turn. Take first man's first meeting with first woman. Sight. Vision. Enough for a most successful communication. <sighs> but increased competition led to the need for better communication. So this man added sound. I'm the biggest, bravest, boldest, roughest. And his communication was the best. <sighs> but again, more competition. I'm the biggest, bravest, boldest. More competition required man to be more persuasive. So he added motion. And the idea was well received. <sighs> but the final victory went to the one who had added still another dimension to his presentation. The man who knew how to add and to transmit and to create emotion. Time went on. The people moved further apart. The old sight and the old sound wouldn't communicate over distance. So man invented codes, something the other person could translate, decode. He tried it with a code in the sky. The translation was not always quick or easy or accurate. Coded messages could be sent by sound. But these were hard to decode. Further distance led man to develop a code that could be carried. A code called print. One that knew no limitations of distance. Still, a code to be learned, deciphered, translated. Time between people disappeared with the electric invention of a way of transmitting sound with no code at all. I am the biggest, bravest, boldest, roughest, toughest. It was, boss, and still is, very effective. <sighs> but then came the electronic form of communication that required no code, no translation. I'm the biggest, bravest, boldest, it roughest, was face to face, toughest, sight, sound. Rises, it created wildest, emotion, whatever it did. Greatest. And so effective is its combination of sight and sound and emotion that it usually leads to most successful motion. Well, it's not quite that simple, of course, but these are the tools of television. Sight, sound, motion, emotion. The unmeasured tools that no one can adequately assign dollar figures, that upset any cost per thousand comparisons of media, that can mean the difference between profitable production and overproduction. And there are other television tools as well. Listen. The fact that every television audience is essentially a captive audience can hardly be denied. Any more than we can deny that the simplest movements anywhere turns an unattractive magazine or newspaper page and leaves nothing in the way of advertising impression or experience. I distinguish between dynamic and static media. A dynamic medium is one in which the recipient has to make an effort to escape exposure to the commercial message. A static medium is one in which he has to make an effort to obtain exposure to the message. Television and radio are dynamic media. The newspaper is a static medium. The role of television in our production economy has already been stated. Television has played a major role in increasing our wants thus helping to raise the standard and the level of American living. Among the greatest contributions that television has made so far is the way it stimulated ideas. Coming into commercial use soon after World War II, it helped to spark a big advance in the national economy. Much of the prosperity during these wonderful 50s must be truly attributed to the forces of television in moving merchandise and thereby keeping our great productive progress flourishing. Television is becoming increasingly important to our country's economic health. I believe that television is the most potent advertising medium ever devised by man.
The future? First, it will probably be an expansion of the explosive past. Arno Johnson reports personal consumption must increase $16 billion annually in the next 10 years to keep abreast of increased productive ability. Listen to another expert, Sig Larman. One third of general food sales come from products not available 15 years ago. Over half of General Electric sales of major appliances is in products developed since the war. 70% of Procter & Gamble sales are from products developed since the war. In the past 10 years, the number of advertising agencies has doubled. In the next 10 years, the number of people applying for college entrance will double. Philip Morris reports that some 80% of their sales this year will come from products they did not have five years ago. The Grocery Manufacturers Association president estimates that 10 years from now, more than 50% of grocery product sales will come from products non-existent today. America's future expansion can come in all industries, if we maintain the need for this expansion. Over the next 25 years, we will need 100 billion barrels of oil, which is three times the current known U.S. reserves. Faster tools for faster managing of our industries include machines that make 40,000 additions or subtractions a second, electric calculators that read or record 20,000 characters a second. Their application will revolutionize the facts at our disposal. Dollars spent for clothing is already 150% more than in 1940, and the new miracle fibers will revolutionize our dress and our electric appliances as well. And the number of electric appliances offered for sale has doubled since 1941. Appliance sales volume is five times as great. New electronic devices will remodel tomorrow's kitchen. The electronic field itself has grown from $300 million in 1939 to over $5 billion today. And electronics have been responsible for growth in other industries, the germanium of the transistor and the titanium of the jet. And for the jets has come the petrochemicals, expanding in areas from vitamins to antifreeze, paints to food flavorings. America's trucks have doubled their workload in just 15 years, while the railroads spend over $3 million a day to modernize. From the advances in synthetics, from the potential of the two-car homes, to longer life through new wonder drugs, America's future can be summed up by this quotation from the Committee for Economic Development. Economic growth in the next 10 years will represent $600 billion worth of new construction for highways, factories, schools, etc. The staggering aspect of these figures is brought into focus when we learn that comparable real estate in being today totals only $500 billion. The future of America is one of dramatic growth. If we will but sustain that growth through our own creative and equally dramatic application of our own skills skills applied to the tasks of the production of products and the production of consumption through our production of more efficient advertising. But time is already moving at a rapid pace. If we in advertising do not increase our own rate of production, the time may too soon be too late. As J. Lewis Powell has put it, if you take all 50,000 years of man's recorded history and capsule it into a period of 50 years, the history of man follows this pattern. Ten years ago, man left his cave for some other kind of dwelling. Five years ago, some genius invented the first writing. Two years ago, Christianity appeared. Fifteen months ago, Gutenberg developed the printing press. Ten days ago, electricity was discovered. Yesterday morning, the airplane was invented. Last night, radio. This morning, television was invented. Tomorrow, if you're still waiting, the time is already yesterday. To keep this from becoming this, the time is now.